Welcome everybody. It looks like we got about uh, 35 people here uh, and getting ready to get started in just a few minutes. Uh, this is a pre-conference workshop for the NILA 2020 virtual conference. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining in. The session is being recorded today and will be available um, for download later. Let's see. So I'm gonna do a little housekeeping as we're coming up on the top of the hour before we get started. To ensure that today's presenters are heard clearly and that all, all attendees are asked to remain muted, we'll also ask you to keep your webcam off so that we can keep the presenters front and center. During the presentation, if you have questions, we ask that you put them into the chat window in the feed loop site. Um, we'll be keeping an eye on those and we'll be addressing your questions at the end of the program. Um, you can also uh, raise your hand um, while we're doing the Q&A and we'll be able to unmute you. Um, so uh, we'll use that functionality at the bottom of the program. This session is being recorded and will be available to you if you want to uh, take a look at it at a later time. And uh, once this session, along with uh, all of the other sessions as part of the virtual conference um, are watched and consumed, they are eligible for one continuing education unit CEU. A uh, little uh, also insider note for you to be aware of as you make your way through the conference over the next couple of days. If you're enjoying a recorded on-demand conference session and you browse away from that window, whether it's to uh, use the chat function or any of the other features within the NILA conference site, that will reset the timer on the session and you'll need to start from the beginning. So if you do want to use other functions within the conference site, um, while consuming an on-demand program, we recommend opening a, a second browser window to make sure that you don't lose your spot. Uh, links to the materials and pre presenter contact information have been archived and will be uh, available after the conference. Um, many support materials can be found below the video window. Um, there is not uh, materials for today's session, but below the window in um, on the conference site, you'll see uh, many, many of the programs have uh, materials uh, and copies of the slides, etc. Um, additionally, the on-demand programs also have uh, the uh, transcript from the program available for you. Um, live programs will uh, have closed captioning applied and will be available in the archive format, but not during live broadcast programs. So um, we, <laughs> without too much further ado, we're going to get rolling into today's program. Um, I will be serving as uh, the moderator for today's program, uh, leading in the time of COVID-19, a panel discussion of the challenges and difficult decisions made during the operations in the last eight months. So I'm excited to welcome to today's program our panelists. Uh, each of today's panelists is a public library director that was nominated by their local library system director for their leadership during the early months of the pandemic. Uh, of note, we certainly recognize that all types of libraries and librarians have been impacted by the pandemic, but we've chosen to focus on public libraries today to reflect the operational decisions that were placed on public library directors. So joining us today, uh, we have Tina Dalton. Uh, Tina serves as the library director of the Cuba Circulating Library in Cuba, New York. Uh, she began working at the Cuba Library in 2014 as the Youth Service Coordinator, moving to the director's position in 2018. She has a BA in history from the University of Illinois and an MLS from Drexel University. During her graduate studies, she had the opportunity to serve as a junior fellow at the Library of Congress, creating original cataloging for Indo-Aryan and Burmese manuscripts. I think I got through that. Uh, as a lifelong lover of comics, one of her favorite projects at the Cuba Library has been curating a robust graphic novel collection. So welcome, Tina. Thank you. 
Uh, also with us is Scott Jerzombach, Executive Director of the Albany Public Library, and he has been Executive Director for over six years. Scott's also an adjunct lecturer at SUNY Albany's College of Emergency Preparedness, Homeland Security, and Cybersecurity, and a member of the Urban Library Librarians Unite Board of Directors. Welcome, Scott. Uh, Caitlin Johnson uh, is the Library Director at the Schuylerville Public Library. Uh, which is in upstate New York, and she's been director since 2015. During her time in Schuylerville, Caitlin has helped usher in some amazing updates to her community library, including several building projects and successful building referendums. She's also developed innovative programming, including a preschool in the library program called Countdown to Kindergarten and an adult literacy program developed in collaboration with two local libraries and community partners called the Better Read Partners. I am going to truncate some of the rest of that, Caitlin, because uh, no one wants to listen to me read anymore, but welcome, Caitlin. <laughs> uh, and last but certainly not least, we have uh, Chris Sagus, the director of the Utica Public Library. He is a Herkimer, New York native with 20 years of experience in public librarianship. Uh, he's a 2016 grad of Nyla's Leadership and Management Academy a member of NYLA's Legislative Committee, an instructor in the NYLA Library Skills Academy, a member of the Central New York Library Resources Council Legislative Committee, uh, chair of the Mid-York Library System, Director's Advisory Council Steering Committee, and a member liaison to the MBL, MYLS board. Welcome, Chris. All right, so uh, thank you for everyone's patience while I read. This is a very apparent that I am not a children's librarian and not good at story time. Let's jump in. Uh, so first and foremost, I want to give you all the opportunity to help us uh, understand a little bit about your library. Um, so I would ask you to open with telling us uh, where you're located. Uh, I, I know we've, I just said all that, but uh, a little bit more about where you are within the state. Uh, how many staff work at your library? Uh, at what date? did you cease public uh, operations? You know, what time did the building shut down uh, for the, the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, and when did you reserve, resume in-person interactions with the public in whatever form that was? And let's just go in the, the same order that um, I introduced everybody for this first question. So Tina, I will start with you. Okay, great. We are located in Cuba, New York, which is in Allegheny County. It's in the Western, part of the state. We serve a population of, of about 4,500 patrons, so we're a very rural, small service area. Um, we have two full-time and five part-time staff. We ceased operations on March 15th, March 15th, and then we resumed curbside pickup, except for a few stealth curbside pickups that someone may have done during the shutdown. But we resumed um, curbside pickup on June 15th. Then we opened to um, in-house services again on June 29th. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, uh, takes us to Scott. Oh, the dreaded mute, Scott. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. It was a there was a dog barking. Um, so the Albany Public Library is a seven branch library in the capital of New York uh, with a staff of about 140. Uh, we have a service population of about 100,000, but I would argue it's more. I think we're very much an undercounted city. Um, we're also the central reference library for Albany and Rensselaer County. So we get a significant amount of usage from the, the, the population of Albany doubles during the day. So we get a significant amount of traffic from that population. I think we have about 65,000 cardholders. Um, we, we shut down operations uh, the second Thursday of March. I don't remember what the date of that was. And I say that only because uh, the board meeting that Tuesday, we actually passed our, um, how we were gonna, sh our shutdown plan that previous Tuesday. We actually had a plan in place. Um, and we started doing curbside in June and we've been open to by appointment service at two of our locations for about a month now. And we're going to be doing uh, by appointment services at a third location starting next week. 
We've been doing some outside programming, some pop-up library work. We're kind of dipping our toes here and there to see what's successful and what's not. Excellent, excellent. Um, and Caitlin, uh, how about how about things up in sales? Yeah, so Schuylerville is just about 20 minutes east of Saratoga Springs. If you're familiar with the area, we're upstate. Um, it's a very rural area. Um, we have, we're a school district library, so we serve about 10,000 people. Um, we have three full-time and five part-time uh, staff people. And we have a small building. It's just about 3,600 square feet, but we offer quite a bit to the public. Um, and we closed actually on Saturday, March 14th. We had a special board meeting called and closed that day. And then we reopened for curbside on June 15th. Cool. Um, and uh, Chris, how about you and in, uh, in Utica? So um, we are almost smack dab in the middle of the state, exit 31 on the New York State Thruway. Um, we are one of the two co-central libraries in the Mid-York Library System. The city of Utica has about 60,000 residents. Um, just so you know the, the scope of our system, Mid-York covers Herkimer, Oneida, and Madison counties. We have 60,000 or so people in our city. Um, the whole county of Herkimer um, has about 60,000 people. So we are a staff, uh, when fully staffed, we have 25 staffers. Um, we made the decision to close Friday night, I believe it was the 13th of March, because um, we were we had Saturday hours um, that, that following week. We didn't allow the public in, and we systematically shut everything down and unfortunately furloughed a third of our staff who are still furloughed. So we have 16 people now uh, doing limited service. We opened, like most of you, um, for curbside service on June 15th. About a month later, we opened for appointment-based services, which we have been going with since the middle of July. Um, and Scott talked about doing some outdoor programming too. We we started a lot of that in July as well. Pop-ups outside our building, story times, um, a number of other things where we tried to at least be outside while people couldn't get inside and they were still still there. So that's, that's where we're at. Cool. And uh, Chris, keeping with you, as the library moved into all virtual operations, um, what in your opinion, was the biggest challenge to continuing to serve the community? Well, I think for us, it was essentially um, moving everybody into a work from home mode. Um, and also, which, you know, everybody basically had to be on the same playing field at that point. So in, in terms of the... Um, making sure that everybody had the technology at home. And also if we were sending people home, we needed to provide them with work that they could do from home so that they were still productive, felt like they were contributing. Um, we could you know, validate the fact that we were still paying people to work from home. So I think, I mean, <laughs> the biggest challenge was essentially taking all this stuff in here in this 30,500 30, square foot building and everybody's workspace that combined, that basically was about being around people and coworkers um, and then making them all stay at home and look at the screens for several months. So I think that was, it was kind of just, oh wait, we have to do work in a whole new environment. The, only, the fortunate thing I would say is that everybody was doing it at the same time. So um, there was a certain, the, the commonality of experience helped, helped us understand each other probably better than, than if we were in a more hybridized uh, form. Sure, sure. Um... So, uh, Caitlin, same, same question for you. What, what was the, the biggest challenge in making the transition? Well, once we transitioned to being fully virtual, one of our first issues was to try to figure out what type of um, like programs we could offer people, what people really wanted to have um, virtually. So one of the things we discovered was, you know, our meditation programs and mindfulness sessions were really popular. So we started doing more and more of those. Um, we also tried to have like creative outlets for people. And then we, you know, obviously share a lot of uh, social service type information on our social media pages and all of that so that people could find things easily when they needed it. Um, but yeah, definitely trying to figure out how to pivot from our old event calendar that we had going on to virtual programs was, um, was a bit of a challenge for us. But I think we, we got through it, we figured it out, and we started to kind of excel at 
to see what people actually wanted to have. And one of the things we noticed was that with children, um, we didn't have so much interest in virtual events. Um, and we think that's because they were just on their laptops and things for school all day already, that they didn't really want to take part in a library thing that was on the computer. So we kind of switched to um, focusing more on teens and adults for our programming mm -hmm. during that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and Scott, in Albany, what, was, uh, what would you say was, was the biggest challenge in that, that online model? Oh. <laughs> Always on mute. Uh, you know, I'm really lucky to have a really talented staff. Uh, we've already, we had already dipped our toes in virtual programming. You know, it was really amazing how adaptive the staff had become. So from a leadership position, uh, it was uh, the human resources part of the operation. Uh, this is something that had a significant toll on our staff and it, and it was, you know, intensified when June came around and the George, George Floyd killing and, you know, what was going on in Albany at, at the time as well. It's just, um, you know, leading people, managing people, and not just myself, but, you know, my fantastic administration. Um, all of us just, the, the emotional toll and kind of burnout and the strange adjustment for people and then the balance of, uh, you know, the school district closed. A lot of us live in the city of Albany. A lot of us, our kids go to Albany school, uh, Albany school. So the school's closed. So we're home with the kids and the dog barking and, you know, all of those extra stressors. Um, so it was really, again, I think the, the staff really rose to the occasion. The board really rose to the occasion. I think it was for leadership, just the human aspect of the operation became really difficult. You can't just pop into somebody's office and say, hey, how are you doing? Um, you know, we did it through text messages and it's hard to read body language. And sometimes you don't know what's going on with people. Um, and we had a few people who, you know, there was infections in their family or there was possible infections in their family. Um, just balancing all of that and then having a clear message to make everybody feel secure that operations were going to continue and continue smoothly. So that, that was, that was really the, 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 the biggest struggle. Everything operations wise and service wise. Everything went really, really smooth there. It was just all of us struggled, not with leadership, but being empathetic leaders because it was hard to communicate with our staff or really read the room because we're not in the room with them. Yeah, all, all excellent points. Um, and, and Tina, I just want to give you an opportunity with that same uh, question. Yeah, I would definitely echo everything that has been said about that our staff really rose to the occasion as well. Um, and, you know, the challenges of switching to working from home, but on to build on to those things as well. I would think one thing for us that was a challenge was to get the community to see that we were doing virtual programming and get them to engage with it. So because we're a rural community, uh, we're an older community, uh, I mean, the newspaper is still one of our biggest methods of advertising library programs. So we started putting in the newspaper, you know, we're having these Zoom <laughs> book clubs and, and so on, and just getting the community comfortable interacting with us in a virtual format was a challenge. And it took us months to get that worked up. And also we have some staff members who are, you know, they're the rock of this institution. They've been here for 40 years. But that comes with some challenges because they're not as comfortable adapting to newer technologies. But they really stepped up and and learned how to use Zoom and learned how to be comfortable writing um, social media posts and interacting with the patrons that way. So I think um, just getting the community to realize that we're still here and we're still providing content for them, that was one of the biggest challenges for us. Yeah, it's it is. It's um, I see that it's the thread through all of your answers. So the 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 human side of of the the challenges. Um, so I'm curious about now that limited in person services have resumed. Um, what is the the biggest surprise uh, in your operational? Uh, modifications. Um, so maybe an opportunity to talk uh, more logistics, a little more nuts and bolts um, uh, about what you're dealing with now that you're 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 changing the format. And I'll I'll throw that to Caitlin first. 
Hey, you got, got to do the... Yep. <laughs> um, sorry. One of the things that, um, of course, we found most surprising is just the fact that we put away our, our seating and, um, you know, had to, um, you know, kind of tell people that they couldn't sit and stay for the, for the day, that they had to kind of collect their, their books and kind of go on their way. And it's been kind of heartbreaking to have to, you know, tell kids that they can't sit down on the carpet and read a book with their mom and stuff like that. So that's kind of the most surprising challenge that I think we've had since we started things full hours um, of full opening hours back and we're letting people browse and we have half of our public computers open. And it's, it's been going pretty well, but you know, we're a small community so we can kind of handle the, the challenges with all that that comes with it. Um, but it's been going well for us so far. And Chris, how about you? Uh, I think um, the, the funny thing, being stuck in the middle of the city, um, and I certainly know Scott knows what I'm talking about, um, because we're on the way to everything or in between things, uh, you name it, we're, we're, we're around it. Um, we were worried that people were going to be a lot more resistant and um, combative about the, the restrictions, no public restrooms, you must wear a mask that covers your nose and mouth, et cetera. Um, you have limited time here, you can't browse. We thought we were gonna be a lot more uh, confrontational, or I should say, we thought people were gonna be more confrontational and they weren't. Um, and that was that was a surprise because we don't throw a ton of rules at people. I mean, we all work in public libraries. We know what the rules pretty much that we have to constantly focus on are. Um, but our community was really, um, they missed us, they missed being in here. Um, and every con every kind of complaint or why can't you open so and so is or the bookstore you name it, um, you know, having sound reasoning behind it, um, having a board that supported me, um, helped tell the story that it was about protecting our staff and and them. Um, and you know we do have the flexibility. We're not in the middle of you know the the. We have the we we do have the flexibility to work with people. I mean, I don't want to say we didn't bend any health and safety regulations, but you know, when somebody needed to attend their family's wake and they didn't know how to get on Zoom, my assistant director spent a half a day making sure that happened. You know, that's so pe people people the need was there, but a lot of I think the the kind of barriers um, that people set up between libraries and, and you know, getting access, we're gone. So that was probably the biggest surprise. A good surprise. And uh, and Tina, how about how about you? What, what's uh, what's been what's been a surprise? Um, I think we've all been surprised by how slow we've been. You know, we felt like people were going to be so excited that we'd be open again, and the truth is, you know, we're about down half what we would normally be, um, and it's been a little disappointing to be honest, but it's picking up little by little each week a little more and we see someone who we haven't seen since the shutdown coming back. I know we just need to be patient with people feeling comfortable. We had some of the same concerns as Chris that um, there would be confrontational people who were unwilling to follow the safety guidelines that we put in place. But as he said, people for the most part have been really good about it. And if they don't like it, then they didn't come back again the next time. So it hasn't been a reoccurring problem, I guess you could say. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Scott, what, uh, what, what surprised you? Well, I mean, there's some positives in there. Yeah, there's some, there, there's some challenges and then there's some positives. The challenges were moving to a more transactional model, uh, especially with curbside, we realize it takes twice the, the human power to do anything. So whereas, you know, it was pretty simple. Someone comes in for a library transaction to borrow a DVD or a book. It's one clerk. It's very hands-off. Now between appointment services and curbside, you know, there's, a, there's almost a concierge portion of it. Um, and just kind of getting those logistics worked out, it's just a lot of work. It's extra. Uh, you know, I try to explain it to my stakeholders and trustees that you're really 
everything that took one person now takes two people. And that includes, you know, online programming, especially if you're doing live Zoom programming. You know, it used to be you stuck one staff member in, this, in the program room and they did the program. You know, we realized that we need two to three people. We need someone running Zoom, we need an IT backup person, and then we need the person who's running the program. So again, it doubles or triples the amount of people you need to do the work. Um, and that was a huge surprise to me. It wasn't a huge surprise to some of my direct reports and they smiled when, you know, I thought, okay, I was wrong on this one. Um, but it's, it is a lot of work and it, and it takes a lot to do. And, you know, like Tina said, the statistics are, my statistics now are half of what they were. Yet, I think if we did an analysis, we're taking as much, we, you know, we need to schedule, we have more people engaged in the work than when we doubled our numbers. So, you know, that's a, that, not a struggle, it's a challenge. And I think we rose to it, but it's something that we face all the time. Uh, you know, but there are some positives. Um, as one librarian said to me, now when they do a reference transaction, it feels like what they learned in library school. So, you know, the person coming in the door or calling or doing virtual reference, more traditional questions. Of course, the numbers are down, but it's kind of nice. It's kind of nice for our staff, you know, that are working from home and answering the phones. They have a little bit of time to answer these questions a little bit more in depth. And they see, say they feel more like librarians. Um, and, you know, it, it we haven't seen any real pushback at all about our rules, but our libraries always have a challenge with behavior. Uh, I'll be honest, it's nice not to get a phone call on my cell phone at eight o'clock at night about teenagers, you know, throwing a garbage can in front of one of our buildings or someone being passed out in one of our bathrooms. So uh, it, the, I, as I said to a friend of mine yesterday, the stress of operating during COVID um, has, it hasn't increased my level of stress or my staff's level of stress because some of the other stressors right now aren't there. They're coming back, we know that. But for right now, it's kind of actually nice for the staff and for, for everybody involved to actually concentrate on the operation, which is a positive. And then the other thing is we're communicating better because we're forcing, we do an all staff meeting every Monday morning. We do an all supervisors meeting every Thursday morning. Um, it sounds crazy to you never think you'd meet once a week, but we do. Um, and I think our staff are better informed about the operational library. And I think our supervisors are interacting and working together better than they have in, in the past and have a better understanding of what everybody's doing. So uh, we're using this as an opportunity to look in internally and fix some of our process and the way we operate and to improve on that so that when we are open, we're, we're gonna come out of this a better organization. Nice, nice. Um, so looking ahead, all non-association public libraries are required to have a public health emergency continuation of service plan uh, in place by April of uh, 2021. And we could argue that uh, it really would be a good idea for all libraries to have something like that on the books. As you consider the development of your plan, uh, which would no doubt be informed by all the things we've been talking about and what you've learned uh, up, up till now, what advice would you give to others that are preparing a, a crisis plan? Or uh, another way to, to put the same question is, uh, what do you wish you could tell yourself nine months ago? Um, and I'll, I'll kick that one off with Chris. I got the easy one, thanks. Um, you know, that's, that's a great question. I think the thing, um, I, I'm, and it sounds stupid, but I think ultimately what this has, has done is changed our format of long-term plan, long-range planning. Um, you know, instead of looking a year, year and a half out, maybe two, we're looking a lot further out. And I think maybe if I had been kind of, if I had been focused maybe a little bit further down the line, um, that would have been something that would have been helpful, um, you know, for me to think about. Um, but I think the other thing is really the, the intellectual exercise of it, it might be a good idea every three months to, to say, okay, if you had to shut down next week, what would you do? Um, and that's just more work for us, whatever. It's not a, a big deal because um, I think we've all responded and still doing the work, but I almost feel like putting in kind of um, more worst case scenario planning into long range planning um, and not just 
you know, kind of generalized paranoia or anxiety would, would have been helpful nine months ago. I, I don't know. That's just, just kind of adding that to your list of things to think about um, in more, more top of mind than, than as opposed to, oh, there'll be a crisis down the line. I think it's now we're, we're going to plan for a crisis next week more often. Nice. Sure. Uh, Tina, how about, how about you? Well, I would tell myself to stock up on um, emergency PPE, all that stuff, Clorox wipes. <laughs> and I believe that's part of that plan that we're supposed to have six months worth. But um, I would, in future, next time we need staff computers, we're going to purchase laptops so that people can take their work back and forth more easily. Um, and definitely spend more time on staff tech training so they felt feel in future more comfortable using virtual meeting platforms and um, a lot of our staff did a, videos for social media and video editing that type of thing we'd like to have more training so that we're more comfortable with that in the future yeah um and and caitlin how, how about you what do you, what would you tell uh, past you to put in the uh the crisis plan <laughs> Um, just to echo a little bit of what Chris said, I think planning is really, you know, the new thing that we all have to start thinking about more, more and more. Um, so last year we passed our, our new strategic plan for the next five years, and it makes you kind of re-examine what the library's values are, of course, and what people in your area need and from their library. Um, so I think if you really know the why of what you're doing every day, you know what the values are, that when, you know, push comes to shove and there's a crisis, you kind of know what roles you need to step in to fill. Um, so I think really sticking to your plan and just having staff on every level kind of be aware of what the library's overarching goals and you know core mission is, is, is important. So I would just say make sure your strategic plan is based on community input and keep it front and center in everybody's minds at all time because you may need it more in a crisis. Yeah, excellent, excellent point. Um, how about you, Scott? So, you know, we had a continuation of service plan, which is basically what a PRP is since the beginning of March. Um, that's because we have such a great relationship with the School of Emergency Preparedness. Two of us are adjunct professors there. They're the home of SUNY's, SUNY Albany's library school now. So we had actually had discussions about this in January uh, and February. And um, Melanie, and I'm Melanie Metzger, my assistant director, she shared office hours with someone who was in emergency preparedness. So she really got the plan rolling really early. Once, once March hit, you know, it was, it was, we had the plan rolling. So have a plan, of course, have a phased approach plan that you can reverse engineer. So if you look at our plan, our continuation of service plan, because we're still calling that until we don't have to anymore, and then we'll switch it to PRP. Um, so, you know, do a kind of a, a phased approach, what services you're comfortable in doing in those phases, and then reverse engineer it for when you need to step back. I wrote something for Nyla not too long ago that talked about that fader approach. Um, you know, if you're a soundboard engineer or you, you do music at all, you know, you, the fader goes up and down, depend, the bass fader goes up, up and down, to, depending on the reaction of the crowd. So it's the same thing, just work on that kind of, okay, what can we do in these phases? What did we do? What are we comfortable with? Um, so build that plan in place. Um, do it in a, in, to really be, uh, really think about it. Have this be a, something that you're comfortable sharing with stakeholders and members of the public. Um, have it be something that you continually update. And when you update, you have your board and trustees look at it and agree to it. And then you share that with the public. Um, we're lucky, you know, we got a facilities manager a couple, you know, six months before this all happened, who came from a hospital. So I had a really great facilities manager. We were already talking about air quality in, in February and March. Uh, so, you know, we had those concerns in place. Uh, we are, our relationship with the, with the, you know, the staff at CEHC, we have a board member who has a doctorate in public health. Um, and another, and we had a board president at the time who, who was a, who's a, who's a scientist. So, uh, you know, we were just really lucky to have this expertise around us to help us build this plan. 
So what I can say to other librarians is look to see what other resources are out there that's created North Country uh, uh, Library System. They, they have some great resources there. The Oregon State Library has some great resources. The Connecticut State Library has some great resources. Look at those resources, see what the expertise is, and then just look at what other libraries are doing. We don't have, you don't have to recreate the wheel to do this. Really, you know, Upper Hudson, Tim and Upper Hudson, um, we put a committee together and we were working on this to help inform all the other libraries. So that work is there. It doesn't need to be repeated, but you need to create a document that you can share with the public, with local elected officials, with your control room, um, you know, and, and get feedback. And that plan needs to be flexible and changed a little bit, but at least have kind of a clear path forward. And if and sometimes that's two steps forward, one step back, which I think is the phase where we're stepping into relatively smooth, uh, soon. So, you know, just have a well-written, look at what other libraries are doing, have a well-written approach that's a team approach uh, that your staff are helping you write and your trustees are involved in writing as well. And it will make everything smooth. It will make decision-making really easy and it will gain the trust of your staff and some of your patrons. You know, we have patrons who are emailing me saying, you should be open 100%, this is ridiculous. Uh, but for the most part, we just we did a public survey and the, the majority of the public were extremely supportive. Part of the reason they were supportive was they saw our plan, we promoted that plan. They saw, they understood our thinking and saw that we had a scientific approach. So be clear in your communication, but create a document that you're comfortable with sharing with everybody and also that you can work forward on. Nice. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for that. Um, so I want to I throw you guys, a, a, we'll, we'll take a little uh, break here in the middle, maybe a softball question, uh, I hope. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask each of you, uh, who would you say were the, the unsung heroes of the COVID shutdown at your library? And I'll, I'll put Chris on the spot to go first. Well, I mean, it, the, uh, like, I think one of the things about all of this was that um, because nobody had done it before um, and we knew we still had to provide services, a lot of questions were like, hey, what do you think about X? What do you think about doing this? Um, and you, I, my circulation supervisor is the unsung hero of, of, of our library for sure. He put together the whole template for appointments, how we were gonna arrange delivery. Um, he kind of figured it all out. He comes, he came from a retail background. He was a Walmart store manager, um, but he's a librarian, library worker at heart. So um, his customer service, I mean, having a customer service person really helped, um, but he created templates that then our reference department used to create appointments for, um, for, for computer use. Um, and just he modeled, um, modeled kindness and creativity without a without a roadmap to get there. So um, he he just he blew it out of the you know he blew it out of the water, hit it out of the park, whatever you want to say. Um, and it was there was a lot of that, and I'm sure you, those of you who have staff people who did the, did the same thing. It's just there's so many good stories about people um, who got outside their comfort zone, learned how to work. Uh, instead of clipping the newspapers with a pair of scissors and filing them in a manila folder, figured out how to cut and paste from a PDF format of the newspaper and then organize digital files for indexing. It's going to carry forward no matter what happens next. Um, we've, we've changed whole processes and people have, you know, done 180s on the way they did work. But the unsung hero, back to the original question, is definitely uh, Chris McNichol, our CERC supervisor. Just, I wish I had 50 of him. <laughs> Caitlin, I, I bet you have have someone similar. What was uh, what's your un, unsung hero? Yeah, I really have to give a big shout out to all of my staff. They were incredibly uh, creative when we were shut down. Um, and I would say our one of our children's librarians, Holly. Um, she was able to connect with a couple of different um, people in our community and start a virtual story hour each week. And it's gotten over, I think, 2,000 views per week when, the, when we post it. So it's been really great for us. Um, she's connected to a music studio. So they have live music during story time. They, we um, work with another local library. So we have two different people reading stories. And then we have our local park director who kind of gives tours and does sort of a nature lesson at, um, each week. So it's, it's been very popular. And it's got, given us a chance 
um, even though we always kind of went outside the library to do programming and, and form partnerships, it's given us a, a kind of a new outlook on that. Um, and Holly's been great at reaching out to people and different organizations and trying to, to bring them into the fold with the library, so. Awesome, awesome. Tina, how about you? I'd, I'd also say it was our youth services coordinator, um, Sherilyn Wise, who really just knocked it out of the ballpark. So before this um, shutdown, we hadn't done any sort of video or virtual programming. And um, she had that experience in her back pocket, even though it wasn't something that she used in her job here. And so she started creating two to three uh, videos a week that we post. Some were like STEAM experiments the kids could do at home. She read books. Um, we got a purchase of some kits that kids can check out with like STEAM kits and she's been showcasing them in the videos. But it's not, I'm gonna brag on her here, it's not just a shoot and record video. She edits them and there's an intro and an outro and they're really good quality videos. And um, likewise, our library page who, you know, her job is simply just to shelve the books. Well, she, during the shutdown, started doing a series of crafting videos. She would have never had the opportunity to share those skills with, with anyone in the community through this job in normal life. But now it's a, a regular thing that we post every week or two, and the patrons really look forward to it. They enjoy the videos. So definitely the staff generally, but Sherilyn and Riley specifically, really stepped up in new and unexpected ways. So it was, it was really inspiring to me as a director to see them become leaders in such creative ways. Oh, that's excellent, excellent. Um, Scott, I'm sure you got, you got a couple. Well, you know, I am a little uncomfortable picking the MVP in the first, you know, first two games of the series, you know, which, you know, I want people to understand that, that, you know, we're not near the end, we're probably near the middle more than anything else. Uh, and I do play the, the, the role of downer uh, whenever there's COVID discussions in the library community. But, uh, you know, we're not, I can't pick a favorite, uh, you know, I can, you know, I don't want to throw, I don't want to throw out a name because so many people have done so many incredible things, but I'll just say, you know, my leadership, my core leadership group has just been all rose to the occasion, all took on, on ideas, projects, and new responsibilities just naturally, um, and doing it through consensus building and, and, and groups, uh, you know, not just making hard decisions, um, do, you know, or making hard decisions with the, using all of the res human resources that we have within the organization. So just my leadership group has just really been incredible how much they've risen to the occasion and how much outside the box thinking that they've done that they surprised the heck out of me. And I am usually a hard charger. I've been a very slow paced person through this process. And it's just been great to watch them drive forward and be energetic about the services and ideas, you know, to what we can provide the public. So yeah, I can't, I'm not gonna name a name, but I, I would say anybody, any of my, anybody, oh. you know, every, everyone but my supervisors have been amazing. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I'm sorry, chuckling with uh, with Sakis's, uh commentary on the side there. Um, <laughs> Scott, I'll stick with you. If you could tell Governor Cuomo one thing about how libraries have served their communities during COVID-19, uh, what would it be? Oh, what would I say to Cuomo? Uh, you know, I would say that one, this has proven that we're a really important part of the community. Um, you know, that we're that community space and people are feeling it right now, that they can't come to us and use us. Um, I would say that, you know, this has proven that we, we are a large, we are a component of bridging the digital divide and that's created some hardship within our city as well. Um, but the fact that traditional library service is still popular. Uh, curbside pickup, which is something that I kind of thought was a fad, is not a fad. It's something that has been really popular and we've seen a lot of traffic with. So, uh, you know, I, I mean, there's a lot of things I would like to say to the governor. Um, you know, I would have liked a little bit, you know, more, more guidance. I would have liked a little bit more 
more expertise at a staff state level and maybe uh, a better understanding of how libraries operate so that they could provide guidance. Um, and, you know, I, I'm concerned about when there, if, if and when there is a, a rollout of vaccine, that libraries will not be included in, you know, that third phase where public, in, you know, people who work with the public will be next in line to get vaccines. So there's a lot of operational things I'd like to talk to them about. Um, I don't know if we can sell them. We've been trying to sell them on libraries for how many years now? A, a long time. So I, I think it's more of just saying, hey, we needed better support. And the reason why we needed better support is because people miss us and have been very vocal and supportive, but vocal about how important we are to their lives. Uh, how about how about you, Caitlin? What would, what would you would you tell Governor Cuomo about what we've been up to? <laughs> um, I think I'd want to bring up the fact that we we don't just offer books at libraries anymore. Um, that you know we have things like preschool in the library that we continue to do virtually this year. Um, we have you know we we have offer a farm to library produce distribution at our location. So we have you know a, a fridge full of free vegetables and fruit for people to come in and take. We do the free summer meals every year for, for children. So we're also feeding the community that really needs it. Um, so I think this kind of the more social services side of what libraries are stepping into more and more, I think that needs to be um, showcased a little bit um, to our, our government a little bit more, just so that they're aware that, you know, we don't just offer books and a place to sit quietly and read. We're a real community center at this point. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and Tina, what about what about you? Well, I'd make sure that he knew we're not just about books, and we're not just a building in the community. And like uh, Caitlin said, that her children's librarian did a huge part of what libraries do is look at the need in the community and fill that need, and find the organizations that can work together and help them come together. Um, I know that we really serve to fill the digital gap as much as possible. We we got grants for hotspots. We got a grant to expand our Wi-Fi reach, and we've really been able to help the community in that way. Um, we got a grant to purchase all the things we need for our our video making through a local organization, and that equipment is all available to the community if they want to use it for a media lab as well. You know, we, anything that we can do to help the community, I feel like libraries are always looking for ways we can help, whatever that may be, creative ways. So that's what I would wanna tell them. Absolutely, no, these are these are good. I'm, I'm ready to, to take you all to the Capitol, but uh, I'm sure Chris has got some, some crosswords. <laughs> oh, I would, well, I think I would say thanks to the press conferences. Those were, uh, those were actually, those were, those were good. Um, they helped. I think leadership on the statewide scale that he provided was excellent. I think the only thing missing from them next to uh, Ms. DeRosa and Mr. Malachis was a public librarian. So we should, we should, we should be at the next table when there's a pandemic. I love That's that I idea. Say. I love it. Um, so uh, our, we're, we're coming coming towards the end of our time. So I think this is gonna be our last question. So I'm gonna ask you all to put on your, uh, your prediction, prediction hat uh, and maybe look out a little further into the future. Um, as you think about operations going forward into the next year or two years, um, either you can answer it in one of two ways. You know, what, what is your prediction about how things are gonna shape up or you know, what, is the, what is the concern, the nagging concern that's, uh, that's keeping you up at night? Uh, and I'll, I'll stick with Chris and, and, uh, and give you the first swing at it. Um, for us, and I'm sure a lot of you are in the same boat, we are facing um, over the next two years, most likely a $500,000 uh, income shortage. Um, so I don't know how we, all I know is that we, we, will, we will only be able to do less than we're capable of so long as we're, we're faced with with that shortage. That's the thing that keeps me up at night. Um, you know, the welfare of my staff is, is, is really important, but most important is still having a staff that we can 
pay to, to, to do the work um, that matters. So that's that's the biggest hurdle. Um, and I'm not a, I'm not a track guy anymore, so I got I got to work on that. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, uh, Tina, how about how about you? Um, well, I I worry that, like Scott said, we're not anywhere near through this, and that we still have a long way to go. And I do worry about um, maintaining relevance to the community that they will keep supporting us. I mean, they always have been very supportive of the library, but we've always had a great number of programs going and now we're not able to offer those at the same level as we have such a small space, we can't really safely hold in-person programming yet. So I, I worry about um, the community still valuing us at the same level if it does turn out to be one to two years before we can go back to normal operations. So that's uh, when I can't fall asleep at night, that's what's running through my brain. <laughs> all, all valid, all valid. How about, um, Caitlin, how about, how about you? You get your, your, your uh, predictions or your worries? Um, yeah, so like never before with my, my jobs have I felt like I've had, you know, people's well-being well -being so much in my hands with the decisions that I make. So that's been, you know, stressful, keeping me up, I think, the most. Um, just worried about staff and the people that come in, um, especially our older groups that usually use the library and still come in um, with their face masks on now. Um, you just have to kind of worry about them. Um, one of the things I'm kind of hopeful for um, is that we've seen over time how libraries have really evolved and started filling new roles in our in our communities. So I think that, you know, this is certainly an opportunity to grow and to find new ways to help people out um, and to provide services to people. So I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to the other end of this when we come out of this kind of a, a new, um, a new institution, a new field that, you know, we'll have a new direction to go in. So I'm also hopeful. No other way to be, right? Um, so before I give Scott the, the final swing in our, our last formal question, I'm going to remind those of you that are watching through uh, the conference site that you can um, put some questions, if you have any, in the chat on the right-hand side of the screen, um, and I'll be keeping an eye on those. Um, and uh, with that, I'll, I'll give the mic to, to Scott. So anybody who knows me personally knows I'm a ball of anxiety, and I I'm often up at four in the morning thinking about uh, what the next crisis will be in the world. Um, and also anybody who knows me knows that uh, I've been very vocal about the need for libraries to reassess their HVAC systems, think about airflow, think about roof height, uh, think about humidity. Um, I think the work that the Rome Project's doing is, is, is great that they're doing it. Um, I would like some extra layer of expertise that would be translating it. I don't know if Nyla could hire somebody or, you know, it's, I'm hoping a state library will hire someone or take on someone that will be able to translate what they're bringing to us. Um, but I, I'm not as concerned about Formite transmit, transition as I was in the beginning of this. Uh, what I am really concerned about is aerosol transmission and droplet transmission. Uh, and whether or not our HVAC systems, our antiquated air systems, uh, it, are we just recircul recirculating viral air? So, you know, I think this is really, uh, that, that's what library directors and trustees and stakeholders really need to be looking at when it comes to kind of capital improvement or asset improvement for their organization. Because, you know, I think Tina and, and Caitlin and Chris have all pointed out, uh, libraries are a space in the community. And that's one of the most important roles that we fill. We need to be able to do that safely. Um, and we can't do that safely if, you know, again, we're not pumping in more outside air, if we're not opening windows. Um, and if we're not, you know, we don't have a robust facilities crew, staff, cleaners that are coming in and regularly cleaning our buildings. So um, that's, what, that's what keeps me up at night. I mean, that's what I'm constantly, that's the information I'm, uh, I'm constantly sharing with colleagues and through social media is we really need to start thinking about operations because having a dirty building before this was kind of like, you know, something that we accepted because we were resource poor or, you know, that's just the way it was. 
um, and now we can no longer allow to, we can no longer in good conscience operate like that anymore. Um, I think public libraries are already a huge, Chris knows, Chris knows my feelings about public library, uh, about public bathrooms and libraries. Uh, bathrooms have already been a struggle for us. This is gonna make it even more so. Um, and it's something that we really have to re-exact. Uh, I'm not saying change the minimum standards, but I'm not sure how open and free our public bathrooms will be for the next few years. Um, so, you know, just just all, all of that stuff, nothing, nothing I learned in library school, um, but, you know, things that my head of facilities and some of my staff are continually, continually bringing to me for us to discuss and think about. It's why we've selected some of our locations to open and left some of our locations closed. Our, main, our Washington Avenue branch, which is our main library, is not operating. And I am sure that's gonna be the last library that comes online. And the number one reason, it's an old building with really low ceiling. Uh, the airflow in that building is awful. So, you know, we have these new buildings with these high ceilings, great airflow, new HV, you know, thank you DLD for construction grants. Um, some really great, you know, new HVAC systems. Um, those are easier to have open and operate. We feel more comfortable with that. Some, you know, one or two of our locations with the low ceiling and, and not so great airflow. I'm not sure when I'm going to be comfortable opening those. All, uh, all good points. Uh, and yeah, it, there's, there's so many things that are, that are different. Um, I think I, I saw one uh, question come in that I think yeah, I would imagine you'd all give the thumbs up on that will anticipate uh, an expansion of virtual delivery of programs and services to the community going forward. Um, so we are uh, coming up on time. Um, forgive me, I'm looking at the, 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 the question pane there. Um, so, yes, um, so I do want to uh, extend my thanks to the panel. I very much appreciate your time. I hope everyone that's joined us online uh, and helped us uh, pilot out the virtual conference software today uh, found the, the conversation and the panel's uh, discussion a valuable use of your afternoon. Um, I thank you all. I hope that everyone will join us tomorrow at 9 a.m. for the keynote address with Rebecca Miller. Um, looking forward to that. So we'll be back on the same site. Feel free to, to log in and join us for that. Um, like I mentioned at the top of the program, this is recorded uh, today's session along with all of the live programs that are being offered uh, during the NILA, NILA conference. So if you miss anything, you'll be able to, uh, to enjoy it at a later date. Um, so again, with that, I ask you all to, to join me uh, in your thanks uh, of our panelists today. I really do appreciate everyone's insight. Um, and uh, to, to the, the four of you, but to all of, to, to literally all of you on the line today, um, we appreciate the work that you've all been doing to evolve and, and modify your operations and continue to strive to serve your communities in these, um, I'm going to say it, unprecedented times. So um, thank you all. Um, I look forward to seeing you all uh, online, uh, all over the NILA conference website over the next two days. Um, it is going to be the best virtual conference ever. So thank you all uh, for being with us today. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow and Friday. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.